Father God, Lord, I come before you today, Lord, as humbly and trembling as I know how, Father. I thank you for your graciousness. I thank you for your righteousness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for salvation. I ask, Lord, that you touch me, Heavenly Father, as you have me stand before your people, Lord. Move me back further and further, Lord. Fill this space with your spirit, Heavenly Father. Hold me back from saying anything, Heavenly Father, that you don't permit, Father, and help me to speak boldly for what you would have me to say, Father. Use me, Heavenly Father, as I am your tool and I am your utensil, Heavenly Father, that you and you only will be glorified in this day and in this moment. Let every believer under the sound of my voice say amen. amen. Background singers. So I think it was till like 10, 1030 at night. Some, it was pretty late, Pastor, when I was still giving you titles for the sermon, right? And I changed it and then I changed it. And then I changed it three more times. I just didn't send it to him because I'm like, I'm not even going <laughs> to. So this, this sermon, it could have been named so many different things. The first title that I had was Addition by Subtraction. Okay. Then I thought, less is more. Okay. Then as I read through it, I thought about another one, The Best Man. Okay. The Best Man. That would have been a good one, right? Okay. Then I got a little more ghetto. I ain't the one. All right. Oh. I, oh, but I got two more. I need this. <laughs> I'll just change the title and you guys will act like it's something different next time, right? Hey, Amen. You can help me out there. I'm a wrestling fan, big fan of The Rock. You guys know him as Dwayne Johnson, probably. His tagline, know your role and shut your mouth. Okay. And my personal favorite, ain't nobody coming to see you, Otis. Let's talk a minute about, thank you for breaking the ice for me. Let's talk a little bit about uh, John's origin story. I'm not going to go through all of it right now, but you can find this in the first chapter of Luke. John was a miracle baby, okay? Older parents, an angel came in the same way that an angel came to Mary and Joseph to tell them that a child was going to be born. The same thing happened to, to John's parents, okay? The first time that he had an encounter with Jesus, he was in the womb, okay? Elizabeth got a visit from Mary while she was carrying Jesus, and upon hearing, Mary, upon hearing her voice, he flipped in her stomach because he knew that he was close to the Messiah, okay? The Bible says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born, Okay. That's a sermon in itself. I'm not going to mess with that right now. But let's keep that in mind as we go through some of the different things in John's life. Okay. So it's quite fitting, praise God for what he's doing for the totality of this, of this whole service. The responsive scripture reading that we had takes place right before what we're talking about now. So after, shortly after that happened, what we talked about where Jesus had his meeting with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples were out in the Judean countryside baptizing, okay? This was commonly, traditionally over the last duration, this was John's territory. All right? I, I say territory specifically for where I'm going with this, so just stay with me a second, family. So this is where John had already been going. I want to point out one thing, a couple things first here. This was not along the regular beaten path for people who were coming to have a relationship with God, okay? It says in here, the Judean countryside, okay? So this is far out the city. So they had to go to the boondocks in order to come and have this relationship. So that tells you how special this was to them, okay? And the verse that we start off with, it talks about uh, a debate that John's disciples had with a certain Jew, meaning a Jewish official, one of the leaders up there, about purification, okay? So what are they talking about here? So what the, all they're saying here simply is that it was not uncommon for baptism. Baptism was everywhere. Baptism was 
everywhere, just like we have beauty supplies everywhere. Every corner you went, there was some place you can go and get purified before you went so that you weren't ceremonially unclean according to the law, okay? I'm not going to get too much into the law, but just bear with me a second. The difference, the, the reason I struggle with this verse, Pastor, God bless you for helping me with this in the council, that I struggled with this verse and understanding the significance of it here, but the significance of it here was to show the difference in one kind of purification on the outside so that I can go in someplace. Here it is. And being cleaned on the inside. All right? Being cleaned on the inside. John and Jesus were baptizing for repentance, not for their outwardness being clean so that they were holy. Hallelujah. That's a shout right there. So... You, have, you could go anywhere, anywhere, and get baptized and get washed on the outside, but you had to go far. You had to make a trip. It had to mean something to you in order for you to go get clean on the inside and repent it and become a new person. That's a hallelujah right there. So our first point we're going to go through and we're going to look at some of the things about John. I, I was able to, through the Holy Spirit, pull some things out about John and his character and things that we can apply to our life and what this means to us on our everyday basis and the struggle that we go through. So our first point, subtract ourselves from our prayers. Okay. Subtract ourselves from our prayers. Okay. That may sound like it's a difficult thing because when you're praying, you think about yourself a lot of times, okay? Let's talk about prayer a little bit. God gave us power in our prayers, okay? He told us anything that we ask in his name shall be done, okay? Not in a name it or claim it way, but in terms of praying Jesus' will back to him, okay? Pray, you, 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 you get from Jesus, you give back to Jesus, okay? And again, that's, that's that living water thing of that, of that baptism. Thank you, Holy Spirit, hallelujah. That's that going down in the water, and these waters had to be moving, which is why they were out there in the first place and not just in a pool. The water had to be able to move and flow back so that as you go down into the water, that water can flow back again through Jesus Christ, and now you're replenished, hallelujah. That's glory to God. So anything you ask in his name shall be done. James says, the, James 5.16 says, the earnest prayer of the righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Okay? King Hezekiah was given a death sentence by God and prayed earnestly to God and was given 15 more years. Okay? 15 years. Think about it. God came to him and told him, you are going to die. Your days are over. Get your affairs in order. Say goodbye to everything and everybody that you know and love because you were leaving this land. And he got on his knees, prostrate, earnestly praying to God, asking him to change his decision. What does this mean? That we have this power with God, too. But there's, let's, make, let's make sure that we understand one thing here. Okay, this shouldn't make us think about Hezekiah's greatness or worthiness or make, it, make you think that there's anything different about Hezekiah because there's king in front of his name and there's not in front of ours. But the point of this is to give glory to God for being the only one that could have changed his circumstances. Amen. God is the only one who can make that decision, okay? So now we need to ask ourselves, what are we praying for? Okay. Ponder this question to yourself, okay? Leave here with that question in my mind. What am I praying for, okay? What do I talk to God about? Are we praying about changes in our situations for our own comfort? Okay. It's one thing if Deacon Washington is praying for a kidney so he can spend more time with Mother Washington and the rest of us, but it's an entirely different thing when the reason behind the prayer is so that people can see how good and faithful God is through what he's done in his life, okay? So ask yourself, am I praying for something so that God can get glory or so that I can be more comfortable in my circumstances here on earth, okay? Because the word does not promise that everything is going to be easy, okay? Matter of fact, it promises the contrary, Deacon Burbridge. It says that once you gave your life to Christ, that's not the end. That's the beginning, and it's about to get hard, okay? Don't let nobody tell you nothing different. The Christian life is hard, okay? 
but it's more hope than the life that you had before you gave your life to Christ. Okay? Are we praying for others? There are things the Spirit will allow you, and sometimes only you, to see within somebody else for the sole purpose of you praying for that person. Okay? So what does that mean, Brother Watson? That means that you may have a conversation with somebody and you may notice some shyness in somebody about something that they've been dealing with that nobody else knows and nobody else sees it because that smile on their face, that mask that they're wearing, remember we talked a couple weeks ago about masquerade and the party's over, let's take those masks off. Maybe Brother Watson can see that mask so that when he sends you that card and he writes that special message in it, it touches you and it might have been just at that time you needed to know that some Somebody cares about you, okay? Y'all watched the sermon this morning, right? What did the pastor say? God uses people, right? God uses people in order to get through to us, okay? So that when we're closed off and, when, and then we're hidden and we're not letting anybody know what's going on with us when we get into these things, and I've been guilty of it, I'm guilty of it now. There's times where you're closed off, you feel like you're the only one and you're carrying these different burdens, And you are blocking off yourself from being helped because God just wants you to open up so that you can see that person that he sent there to help you. Okay? Because rest assured, if you prayed and you called out to God, he's going to send somebody there to help you. Are we giving thanks to the Father when we pray? Okay? Stop here for a second. Let's think about this for a second. Just rewind to your last couple prayers. You know, put the ones you have on DVR for the things. You, you ask God to, to bless your finances. You ask God to bless your health. Okay? Okay. You ask God that you needed a new job. Okay. Less selfish. Okay, fine. So, you, you, you prayed for somebody else, right? We've been doing intercessory prayer. Right, sure. So we've learned, Pastor's been talking to us over the past month, and we're learning. He assigned different people. So I pray for you, Jessica, right? So I pray for your, your, your job. I pray for you to get a new car. I pray for your grandchildren. I pray for things with you. Okay, fine. Okay? I pray for my church, right? Where in there did I say, thank you, God, just for being the God that you've always been, even if you don't ever do anything else for me? Okay? Hear me, hear me. Even if, say this to God. I challenge you to say this to God. But mean it if you say it, because God don't play. If you never do anything else for me, I thank you for the goodness that you have had for me and the goodness that I see in the life of other people and that if the prayer that I'm asking you for, that I'm bending down on my knee and I'm crying and I'm feeling all these different things in me for, if that prayer never comes to fruition, it's not because you are not a God who is able. Okay? (laughs) Rhetorical question. I'm not getting in your business. But... Thank God for being God, okay? God was the creator way before he created you and I, okay? So let's thank God for the different things. We have some people out on vacations right now. They're going to all these nice, warm spots. Um, Pastor Moore prayed for somebody earlier, and he, he thanked God for their ability to spend time in nature, okay? It's beautiful to be able to get someplace else and to experience things, and that way you can see and understand that that roof that you have over you, that's not God's ceiling. That's just you, okay? That's just you. Look, as I'm talking, I'm getting lower and lower because this is what we do to ourselves, right? This is what we do to ourselves, right? Because as, as we're looking at our problems, right, as God's looking at our problems, that's all the way down here, okay? And the vastness of what God is able to do for us, okay, because he is omnipotent, right? All powerful, right? Okay, because he is omnipresent, okay? That's beautiful that God is so powerful and everywhere at one time that he can bless all of us and then some. Amen, all right? You know, God is so, is, is, is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. I know I probably said it wrong, so don't tease me about it afterwards, okay? <laughs> But it's, it's God's ability to know everything even before we ask. So like a loving father, and there's a rumor out there that I got five kids. <laughs> even when I say it, I'm like, ouch, man. 
<laughs> and my wife laughing too, like, yeah, I don't know where that happened from. <laughs> so I can look at each of my kids and I can, I can tell what's going on in them sometimes in a way where it amazes them because um, I don't necessarily always have to spend a ton of time in order to do that. Some of that's because they're just, they, they think they, re, they invented the wheel and they're just doing the same things that me and their mom did growing up all the time. Um, and I look at it and I get closer to God and my relationship with my father by knowing that if this is all it takes for me to be able to see some things with my kid, my, my kids, my creator, my heavenly father, you see where I'm going with this. Glory to God, my heavenly father, and, and what it takes for him to be able to have a relationship with us is just a blink of an eye. Yes, yes. So I thank God for that. Yes. Okay. So how are we using the power we have in the gift of prayer? Okay. The, remember, prayer is powerful. Prayer is effective. Okay. Prayer, prayer is, our, is our communing with God, okay? It's asking God for things, it's thanking God for things, it's talking to God for, about different things that's going on with us. This is a tool. This is the most powerful tool that we have to help us on a daily basis. So we have to ask ourselves, how are we using this, okay? Are we living below the power that we have in prayer, okay? In other words, let me make that plain. Let me make that simpler. Is there something that's going on with you, Michelle, that... The reason why it is is because I haven't talked to God and prayed to God about this. I'm not picking on you. I said you, but I really meant me. <laughs> okay? Is there something that's a problem that doesn't have to be a problem, but it's a problem because I haven't taken it to God? Okay? That's a question that we have to ask. Okay? How often are we praying? Okay? This is big. This is big. What does the Bible say? Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing, right? That means pray all the time, right? If you awake, you should be praying. And you know sometimes I wish I could dream prayers. <laughs> I need God just that much. I want to be able to pray 24-7. And the beautiful thing about this is that we are not limited to our ways of communicating with God, Pastor Moore, okay? So if we're not able, if I'm at work and I'm dealing with a customer and I don't have an opportunity to actually come and say something to God, I can speak to God in my heart. Because I have a father who is so powerful and everywhere and so knowing that he can hear my prayer in my heart before I can even mutter a whisper. Hallelujah to the power of God and his relationship and openness to receive our prayers. And he wants them. He wants our prayers. <laughs> okay. It's my next point. Subtract ourselves from our service. Okay. I got more questions for you, okay? Self-evaluation day today, okay? I'm not condemning anybody because I was, as, as I was writing this, as the Lord was having me write this, I'd write something, and then it would go nowhere. And my wife's looking at me like, you ain't studying, you ain't doing nothing, you're going to get up there and flop, what's wrong with you? I'm like, every time I go to say something, the Lord takes it back because he's correcting me on these same things just as I'm writing it. So I thank God for that. Okay. Next question, are we doing service like the Pharisees did? Are we serving for accolades and comfort, or are we serving for God? Because okay. they don't look the same. They don't look the same, okay? So, you a good cook, right? That's what they say, right? I, I, I've sampled. I can, I can co-sign that. You a good cook, right? Okay. So, when it's time to sign up for something, you might sign up to make some food, right? But that's not what we want from you. That's not what we want from you, okay? We want you to watch some kids, and you watch kids all week, and you be tired by the time Sunday come, and you ain't trying to watch nobody else's kids. But that's what we need you. Right? That's what we need you. So, our, so, so now that makes us have to evaluate our service, okay? Why are, what are we serving? How are we, are we, are we putting a box on how we serve? Or are we willing to be stretched? I love it every time I hear somebody talk about how they're struggling in service, and they're like, because this is a stretch for me. Yeah. Well, duh. <laughs> yes, thank God for that. Thank God for being able to be flexible. 
right? Because that's what stretching gets you, right? It makes you flexible, okay? Because just because you're able to serve in one area, what happens when that's not needed? So do you not serve? Do you not serve then? Ask yourself that question. Because if you're saying I don't serve then, then that means I'm going to question the motives of your, behind your service in the first place. Okay? I'm going to think, okay, so are you serving to be seen like the Pharisees? Are you ser- serving because you want to be known by this thing? Or are you serving because you want to be that utility back who can do anything and play every different position that God allows you to have the ability to do? So we have to ask ourselves, what are we serving for? Because they don't look the same. If you're serving for God, it may not be in a place and space of your choosing. You may feel like you have talents in certain areas that could enhance the body of Christ, and you might be right, okay? But let's look at John the Baptist, okay? Let's really go back and read the accounts written about him at some other times, okay? Read the things that Jesus said about him, okay? Great man, okay? The power of Elijah, full of the Holy Spirit before he was born. Man, I wish somebody say that about me. Man, you so blessed. You had the Holy Spirit before you could even come out. That sounds crazy, but that's what the Bible says about John the Baptist. He's so full of the Holy Ghost that he had the Holy Ghost inside of him while he was in his mother's womb. Think about that. That's some power, okay? Jesus said about him after he died that he is better than all the prophets combined. John the Baptist is a big deal, okay? But he understood that he wasn't the one. Okay? All those things are true about him, but he ain't the one. Okay? And he said it, you know, and I, can, and, I, and, I, and I like as I read, I like to try to picture scenarios as I'm reading them. And I'm seeing his disciples come to him, and they like, they like, Rabbi, Rabbi, Jesus over there baptizing people, and you just baptized him. And now all the people who was coming to us, they all going over to Jesus now. And, and I can just picture him. I know he was wild looking, you know, hair. Huh. Wild looking. <laughs> yeah. Wearing fur, eating locusts and honey out in the, in the desert, in the wilderness. Okay. Hey, man, I ain't the one anyway. This ain't about me. I already told y'all when y'all started following me that I'm not the Messiah. You already know that. So when you see the one who I told you is the Messiah and you saw it co-signed by God himself because you saw a dove come and land right on his head, what more do you need? So why are you coming to me talking about all the people who was following me is now following him? I'd have been like, why Why y'all ain't with him too? (laughs) Way better than me. He understood that Jesus had a different position than he did, okay? He calls Jesus the bridegroom, and he calls himself the bridegroom's friend, okay? He's happy for the friend and not jealous, and he's not trying to overshadow Jesus' ministry, okay? Okay. Y'all acting like y'all ain't know that Christian rivalries exist. (laughs) Y'all got all quiet there like y'all don't know that people are jealous of other people because of the anointing that they get. And they are mad because that's taking something away from them as if God isn't getting the glory. So what's the point? What's the point? Okay. He was happy to be the bridegroom. Okay. So let's, let's do a little history in that. So we think of the best man right now. We think of the best man standing next to the groom in the wedding party. You know, he throw the bachelor party, you know. <laughs> Get your minds out the gutter. <laughs> he throws the bachelor party. He holds the rings. He does all those different things, right? He puts money into the wedding, different things like that. Um, he gives a toast at the reception. Okay. But when they're talking about the bridegroom's friend then, so in ancient times, you weren't married until your marriage was consummated. Okay. If you don't know what consummated means, just go with me and we'll just pretend that we don't got to say smaller three-letter words right now, okay? <laughs> so you weren't married officially until your marriage was consummated, okay? And the bridegroom's friend's job was to stand outside of the door, 
okay? And listen until he heard the bridegroom let him know, we married now, y'all, okay? And then instead of being upset that he's not the one doing the consummating, he's happy and he's celebrating that these two are together before God, okay? He's happy and he's celebrating, but he's not the one who this party is about right now, okay? But he's so glad to be there. He's so glad and honored to be in that role, and that's the position that John the Baptist was in, and that's what we have to look at and try to emulate in our own life now, okay? It may not be about you this season, okay? You may be good at what you're good at, okay? And it may be a benefit to the body of Christ, but that's not what this season is for you, okay? If you want a relationship with Christ, if you want to grow, then that has to be okay, okay? It has to be okay that this might not be your season to get your number called, okay? That does not make you less saved. It doesn't make you less anointed. It doesn't make you less blessed. It doesn't make you less prosperous. You are still a child of God, and matter of fact, the team's Look, okay, let me put it this way. Let's talk basketball for a second, okay? Everybody in the NBA can ball, okay? I've seen scrubs that we, that we say are scrubs, okay? I've seen them warming up, just taking the ball behind their backs, right? Stuff that you've never seen them done in the game. You call them a bum, and I'm telling you that everybody in the NBA is more talented than the people you see on the street the difference is that they know their role and their position on their team. Okay? So, yeah, I could score 40 a game, but that's not what you need me to do. You need me to play defense, right? You need me to guard the other team's best scorer, okay? So, because I'm the only one who can do that. So, that means somebody else is going to have to lead us in scoring, okay? So, that means I may lose, I may lose out on endorsements, Okay? That's money, right? I may, I may lose out on, on all pros. I may lose out on all-star games. Okay? But what if you get a championship out of it? Right? Because the goal is to win, right? And if the goal isn't to win, well, then you have to question whether or not um, you suffer from Phariseedom. Okay? John was obedient in what he was asked to do. That's all I'm trying to say there. Okay. For us, that could look like being obedient to our pastor's vision for our local church. All right. So jump on a prayer call. Okay. Tap in the Bible study. Okay. Um, be available and flexible in how we serve as our church is growing in different ways. Okay. Taking yourself out of the equation will have you doing things and not understanding why you're doing them in the first place. Don't be surprised if after, after today you leave out and you find yourself walking up to some perfect stranger asking them to pray for him and then leaving back like, wow, what was that, God? Okay? That's a beautiful thing if you can be in that space to where God can say something to you and you can do it just like that without thinking. Okay? It happens from time to time, but a lot of times we get in the way and we question. Why you want me to do that, God? I don't know that person. How are they going to react? You don't know what they need. You don't know why you're going to do it. And you know what? It don't matter because that's what God asked you to do at that time. Okay? So you go ahead and you do it. You walk up to that person. You say, hey, brother, hey, sister, I just feel the need to pray for you right now. Can I pray for you? You say what God asked you to pour out of your heart. You say, God bless you. You walk away. Okay? And let God do the rest because that's God's business with God's people. Okay? My third point. Subtract ourselves from our desires, okay? Subtract ourselves from our desires. Psalm 37 and 4 says, take the light in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Other translations say the desires of your hearts, meaning the same thing here. Then I'll, I'll add that to 1 Samuel 13 and 14, and it calls David a man after God's own heart, okay? So let's say this. And David wrote Psalm 37, too. Okay. So David is, a, is an expert on what it takes to, to get the desires of his heart from God. Okay. He's also an expert on how to waste the desires of his heart, but that's another sermon, too. Okay. So David is a man after God's own heart. 
And if we delight ourselves in the Lord, then we will get our heart's desires. So what this tells me is to step back and set our hearts after God's heart. Okay? Okay. We have to make what our heart wants be what God's heart wants. And then the desires of our heart, you see where we go in Deacon Reverage? Then the desires of our heart match our Heavenly Father so that what we're asking is already in his will, which is why you've heard pastors say many times, when you pray, you don't got to say if your will be done, because if you are praying and you're having a, a heart after God, your desires are already matching him. All right? So we want the desires of our, of, of our, of our heart to match God's heart so that they're one and the same. Okay. John the Baptist had a desire to please God and urge people to repentance. He didn't desire a bunch of followers. He didn't want accolades. Okay. Actually, some of his disciples did leave and started following Jesus at a different time, and he was happy for them. Okay? Okay. Pastor, I think that if, if John the Baptist was around today, he'd be one of those guys that doesn't have any social media at all. He'd just be this straight-up, low-key, humble guy, right? He wouldn't do things. Like, you see, you all see the videos where somebody's walking up to somebody on the street, and they give them this envelope, and it has, it's supposed to have, like, $10,000 in it or something like that. And they do all of this, and they get them to cry, and they tell them that I'm the one who gave you this, and I'm the one who's changing your life, so you go forward and pass it on. But never giving God the glory in any of those things, Right? They never tell them to get into a relationship with Christ. They never talk to them. They never pray for them. They just want you to know that I had this power in my hand, and I was able to change your situation for a temporary time, so exalt me. Okay? I mean, if that's good enough for you, then go for it. But what God's able to give you is much more exceeding and abundantly greater than what anybody's able to give you in any envelope. Okay? Plus, when God gives it to you, I had, I had somebody tell me once that be careful about opening a gift and just tearing through the paper and dis- disregarding the card, okay? Because oftentimes, and as I've gotten older, I've experienced this more and more, whatever is in the card, Sister Harper, those words, they came from that person's heart. That meant much more than that tangible object that may wind up at a garage sale one day. Okay? So what that person said in that heart, that card, that can stay in your heart, and they can encourage you for a season when you're low, and they can push you forward. It's nothing like somebody telling you, Barb, I see you. Keep pushing forward, okay? I see you. Keep, keep, keep pushing forward. Let God get his glory. All right? I know you may be struggling right now. You don't want anybody to know it, but, but let God bless you, okay? And I see you. You just keep pushing through. That'll stay with you from a season to a season to a season. And the next time the devil tries to use that same thing against you, you said, no, God showed me that he sees me. So dirty devil, that lie from the pit of hell will not work against me a second time. I'm almost done here, guys. So earlier I mentioned... I mentioned other possible titles, you know, earlier on about what this was, what this sermon could be called, and one of them was addition by subtraction. But the more I prayed and studied, I saw that that wasn't quite accurate, that that wasn't really going to be a good title at all, because in reality, this is more like addition and subtraction, okay? Listen to, to John the Baptist's words. He must become greater and greater and I must become less and less, okay? Two things are happening simultaneously here, okay? One thing is growing or moving forward, and the other is shrinking or moving backwards. So, so what does that mean? Okay, how do we emulate that? Here are three examples on how we can emulate that. We can decrease our anxieties while increasing our trust in the Lord. Scripture, 1 Peter 5 and 7, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Number two, we can decrease our pride by simultaneously increasing our praise. Less pride, more praise. James 4 and 10, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. Chloe, number number three is decrease our fears and increase our confidence in the Father. Psalm 23 and 4, say it with me, y'all, Old Testament. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, 
for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So what does all that mean? It's not about Liz, it's about the Lord. It's not about our Nathan, it's about the Almighty. It's not about Chris, it's about Christ. Okay? It's not about Gloria, it's to his glory. Okay? Don't, don't come rush the stage because I'm calling all y'all by y'all first names, okay? It's just for the sermon. I'm going to go back to being respectful to you after this, okay? And it's not, about, it's not about John the Apostle who's writing about John the Baptist who is being read and talked about by John Brown. It's about Jesus. So let's move to the background and let the Redeemer of our salvation take his rightful spot as the true head of our lives. Let us pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for being so wonderful and majestic, Father. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for being greater than anything that we can come against, Father. Help us, Heavenly Father, to decrease while you simultaneously increase, Heavenly Father.